Uh, so this is a panel that I'm sure uh, a lot of you have been looking forward to. And it's a, it's a delight for me to be uh, sitting here and to have this conversation with uh, uh, three, three friends, uh, who, two of whom I've worked with for, for many, many years. Uh, and and uh, Pat, I've, I've met you recently. So, um, so welcome to our first panel of, of, of day two. So I guess uh, you know, everyone here uh, knows how, pretty much how deal sites work. And I, and I think most of you uh, have, have purchased something online from a deal site. Who of you have not purchased anything uh, from a deal site? Wow. Oh, just, just, I just see one, one hand. So, so uh, two, Lexi, I'm surprised. <laughs> you should stop buying from Amazon <laughs> and then uh, try buy local. But so th this is great. So that's about a 99% uh, uh, ratio. And, and I guess uh, just before we start, you know, the, the idea of this panel is really to get deeper into the uh, issues, challenges, and experiences that these three leading deal sites in the Philippines have, have experienced in their years of operation in the Philippines. So uh, this will not be a forum to, to have any, to, to voice any personal complaints or bad experiences. Uh, we can take that offline uh, because, you know, we, we do have limited time and I'm sure you have a lot of questions for, for, for this panel of experts. So just to kick things off, uh, perhaps, perhaps we, can, uh, we can start one by one and ask you guys you know, your, your initial impressions. What are the first thoughts? I did not give them any uh, questions beforehand, so this is 100% uh, uh, on the fly. But maybe we From can the start, heart. Maybe we can start, <laughs> yeah, that's right, Bart, Pat. Maybe we can, we can start off with you. Pat, what are your first impressions? I mean, you've been in the Philippines, what, nine, 12 months or? Two and a half years. Oh, two and a half years already. Yeah. So, you know, how, has those, how have those two and a half years been for you and for Groupon? Uh, well, for Groupon, I've been with Groupon for about one and a half years now. Um, and so I can tell you that uh, it started here as a very small economic, and then the way Groupon grew essentially is through acquisitions of all the local uh, companies, copycat companies essentially. And so, um, and that's how we grew to 48 different countries around the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, I can tell you that in the beginning, and I don't know if anybody knows the growth patterns of, of Groupon, but essentially it was start, started or funded or internationalized by Rocket. I think we're going to have a Charlie later on, right, to talk about Rocket. And they're no longer part of Groupon. Um, but essentially, in the beginning, it was, it was actually before we were a publicly traded company, it was all about, you know, top line growth top line revenue growth and stuff. And I think the difference now, and this is not just in the Philippines, this is internationally, the focus is really on the customer. I mean, I, I, it looks like 99% of you guys have purchased from a deal site. And whether or not you guys have had a great experience or a bad experience with, with any of the sites, um, I think it, it, it doesn't matter as much anymore. I think what matters for Groupon, and not just here in the Philippines, is really the customer. It's a 100% it's a focus on the customer. And the customer is not just um, you know, the subscribers, which is you guys, it could also be the merchants. And so um, I, th I think that's really the, the way it's really shifted. And we don't really, uh, you know, we, of course we focus on top line growth, but that's not really the real focus right now. That's not the core of Groupon anymore. Well, thanks, Pat. It's really been fascinating to see how, you know, the deal sites have evolved uh, in the Philippines from the original Groupon model from, you know, from the early days in Chicago where you actually you know, had a 24 hour, well, you still do, yeah. but some of the other sites here in, uh, here in the Philippines don't have that, that, that clock uh, anymore. And maybe, maybe we can ask Fred, you know, what is the Philippine style deal site like and how has that evolved so far? I think it's not only, it's working? Yeah, it's not only deal site, it's uh, whatever is the business you, you try to bring in the country, you have to adapt it to the local specificities. So, uh, if I take the example of Groupon, um, I mean, Cash Cash is, is an independent, so we don't have, for the good and for the bad, uh, the restraints and, and the, the guidelines that international uh, com company headquarters give us. So, um, for example, you were talking about the 24 hours. I'll give you an example. On Cash Cash, we let the deal from 10 to 12 days. Some let it lo less, some let it more. Um, but we notice, for example, that 30% of our sales are made during the last five days. So it's just to show that at the end of the day, you really have to think, uh, you rethink the concept. You cannot plug and play by, by itself. Um, to go back to your first question about the, the, the deal side, um, because the theme, of the, the theme of the topic is uh, evolution, right? So I guess in Philippines, 
I'm not talking about over market. In Philippines, deal site is interesting for one major reason. It's the sparkle of e-commerce. I mean, before there was only a uh, plain uh, and mostly Airline. Cebu Pacific, to be precise, yeah. uh, and a little the other one, but there's still a little, etc. But roughly, it was only that type of product who were selling online. Filipino discover with this site that you can buy other things, any things online, and more or less, it's not a so bad experience. Yesterday, we had Zeni Maglayan on stage, and she disclosed that only 200 complain about uh, digital, she said. I guess including Cebu Pacific, in one year. That means one complaint per working day. I would be curious to have the one of over a big corporation. Out of the millions that we serve, if I yeah, may add, right? Actually out of the 200 million. out of the millions that all of the sites serve. Yeah, because I don't know the figure of my colleague, but uh, I'm sure we are talking about uh, easy uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions every day, yeah. if I extrapolate my transaction. So it's really, it's, it's not so bad for a pioneer uh, uh, industry. Well, I, I, you know, I agree with that, Fred. I mean, it's, it's really after you know, the initial excitement about Cebu Pacific and getting discount on discounted tickets, it was really the deal sites that, that kind of woke up uh, online Filipino shoppers. And, and one of the very first pioneers to, uh, to bring, uh, to bring a deal and group buying into the four was, was a company called Ensogo. And so maybe I can ask Jojo, who is the uh, managing director of Insogo, his own experience about you know how 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 has it been the past uh, three years that you've been operating here in the Philippines? Okay, so, so hello. Uh, so Jack, I can only um, speak from the perspective of the past year. I actually took over the company um, a little more than a year ago, uh, but I can describe it maybe from the perspective. Uh, you know, and you guys have ridden roller coasters before. It's uh, you know you, you go up, then you get an exhilarating ride, right? It's uh, like anything, it's a great roller coaster ride. Uh, what I didn't realize is that um, you actually have to push the roller coaster up yourself to the hill so that you can actually get down. So it's, it's a tough business. Uh, I think a lot of people um, have realized, um, the ones who've actually jumped into this business, there are a lot of deal sites. Um, it's easy to get into, but tough to sustain. And I think um, over time, I think as, as Patrick and, and my colleagues have uh, acknowledged, really uh, over time it's gonna evolve to something else. In fact, what I'd like to, in hopefully in this forum, that we can actually stop calling it deal sites because it's we're not, that was maybe the original, right, um, value proposition, but I think we're really moving to local commerce. The business model is evolving, right? Um, and at the same time, I think the, the market will consolidate. Um, I don't know any market where uh, consumers will open more than 40 deals in their mailbox, right? Uh, and actually go through and pick out which one's the best, right? So, so the market will consolidate. The ones that who really understand how to innovate and actually address the consumer requirements. And, and by the way, let me point out that the, the one thing, the insight from when I was a moderator yesterday, um, and I think I want to allude to, I think it was um, Oliver, who was in Nava, was saying, well, customer satisfaction actually starts with um, bringing out the best product first. So it's not necessarily just having uh, a channel to the consumers that you can answer the, their, cons their concerns. You got to start with how do we actually keep the customers from calling? So, it, so when it, with a local commerce site, right? Not a deal site anymore. Social commerce. Yeah, social commerce, social right? commerce. Yeah. Local social commerce, right? It actually starts with the right quality partners, right? So, so it starts with that. And I think over time you will see that that's going to evolve. Um, and I think... Um, that's where the market will start con to consolidate. It's certainly been fascinating to watch, uh, you know, just in the span of a few years, how the original Groupon model, uh, I would say the first, the first one to, to, to do this, was based on, was, was time-based. And it was also based on having a minimum number of buyers uh, actually completing a purchase of a specific item. But we're not seeing that uh, in the Philippines pretty much. Internationally, um, it's what still used, though. Internet, what, so what's <laughs> different about... The, the Filipino shopper and why why does he not want to have that that clock and that having to have this minimum number of buyers? I, th I think there's multiple reasons for this, but perhaps the foremost reason is that um, Groupon was not the the company to educate the market here, um, and so uh, other sites might have not seen the value in that um, because in any sales, if anybody here is a salesperson or whatever, um, one of the things that's most important is this tool called the time hammer, 
right? And so that's essentially what the original model is for. It's a time hammer for people to get the purchase or whatever. But um, here in the Philippines, I think it's not being utilized, and, and that's fine. I think we've grown to be this, um, this industry that does not use that and still will purchase Groupons, um, just as long as they kind of understand how long that deal is going to last. Um, but but I, think, I think going to your point earlier about how this has really evolved, even if, if I don't know if anybody follows you know, Groupon as a, if you own stock in Groupon or anything like that, but um, the things that uh, I can say that Groupon in the Philippines um, has not really evolved much, except for the fact that we're, we're moving towards a more customer-focused uh, mindset. Um, but however, Groupon internationally, or I'll say in the US, is completely different. Um, the way it works is that it's not just a deal site type of thing anymore. It's really just a capacity planning tool for merchants. Um, and a lot, a lot more merchants are seeing the value in that, and uh, you know they're they're utilizing it whether it's in real time if they have you know uh, you know from two two p.m. to four p.m. if they see that they don't have any you know seats that are if they have seats that are not being utilized they can just put up a group on deal themselves, and it's really interesting how, th how that's working right now, and all of that will be coming to the Philippines soon for merchants and subscribers alike. So, should be good. Uh, uh, Fred, do you do you agree? As usual, <laughs> not so much. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, actually, I'm, I'm, we are between friends, so uh, no, I'm, I'm agree. It's just that um, there is a few things I, I see it a little differently. For example, about the market, uh, I think for me, the market is already organized. You don't have 40 websites. The truth, you have probably one big player who is the top one. Under, you have two players who are fighting top two, top three. Uh, after you have probably one or two other players, and these top five guys, they own the market, more or less. I mean, we monitor the, the sales, that's the advantage of this industry, you can check the sales. So uh, we monitor the sales, for example, with my team, and more or less, you have five companies who realize maybe 95% of the sales. So I think the market is already uh, organized. Uh, um, so maybe in these five, you will have uh, merging, association, whatever, I don't know, but as of today, that's my perception of the market. The second thing about the 24 hour, I think it's not purely a problem of evangelization of the market. I think it's also the local specificities. Uh, when you have a country where there is a, a, a low penetration of credit card, you need a lot of overpayment system, including the, the, the over the counter. You have pending payment period. So technically, when someone buys something, you have two to three days to pay it. So that means in any case, it's tricky to keep the deal only 24. Um, I think I think the question is not necessarily 24 hours. I think the question is time hammer or the util utilization of time hammer. Uh, I mean, even Groupon, hammer. even Groupon, we haven't used 24 hours since you know the the beginning. Even in the U.S., um, it's been whatever. They they've, we've moved from 72 hours or even 72 plus another 96 hours, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not about the 24 hours. We understand that people take some time to decide on to making a purchase, especially for travel deals or we call it getaways deals, right? You know, how can you just on a whim say uh, I'm going to buy a trip to Paris or something like that? You need to plan it out a little bit, and so we give people time for that. It's true, but I'm just saying at the end, there is still a, a factor of emergency. On Cash Cash, we keep a deal 10 days. I think on Ensogo, it's one week, five to seven days. Um, Metro Deal keep the deal sometimes two weeks, three weeks, but there is always uh, a time limit. So it's just that we adapt it to the local market. Just one last point. Um, I think we have also to... Um, how can I say that? We have to take in consideration that in terms of deal site, Philippines is very strong. I mean, um, if you talk to, uh, I don't know, a VC from Singapore or uh, uh, even sometimes US guy, India, China, Russia, and I'm talking to a lot of guys, and this guy, usually, they sneak around all over uh, Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, etc. And when you discuss with them and you try to get some, some intel about the market, after all, they have a, an overall view that you don't have. Um, you realize that finally, for example, I know that Cash Cash make between six to seven million of US dollars per year. I don't have problem to say it because it's on the system. And I don't have <laughs> stock market, I can talk. So, um, um, and Sogo is probably a little higher, et cetera. So I'm just saying, when you discuss about this type of amount to the guy, they tell you, you know, in Southeast Asia, company who generate this uh, uh, um, uh, volume of sales, in e-commerce, you don't find a lot. You don't find a lot. I mean, um, the, there is a few in each country, but it's not like there is a lot. So the, the, the market has a good traction. So, so Fred, are you saying that the, Philippine, uh, <coughs> the Philippines, with respect to the group buying or deal sites, 
are, are, are we the most advanced uh, in Southeast Asia? No, you cannot say that. Um, in terms of, term of sales, I don't know. I don't have an overall view. But I'm just saying when you talk to guys who invest all over the region, finally they tell you that target, meaning company with a business model who generate revenue, more or less stable, meaning not here since six months, there is not a lot. So uh, we are here to raise the, the, the issue, the point. It's true. But we have also to take that in consideration. Uh, how, about, how about you, Jojo? Um, you know, Living okay. Social has presence in, in all the markets. Uh, about 26 yeah. markets. So, um, so just, just, uh, just a plug. Of, uh, Living Social is actually an uh, investment of, invest, uh, of Amazon.com. So they've recently actually put in another round of funding. So um, Living Social actually has operations in about 20, 26 countries worldwide. One of the biggest markets we are we in, in Asia is actually Korea uh, with Tmon.kr. So they, they actually, um, that we see as a benchmark uh, in terms of a social commerce site. And actually, the, the I can't share with you the mix of, of business, but I'll tell you the, the volumes that they actually, I agree with Fred, first of all, that the traction is here, right? But the kind of volumes and the diversity of the products, you know, meat products, things that are perishables, right? I, I mean, for, forget about, here I was as surprised that we were able to sell refrigerators and um, um, washing machines on site, uh, which we started doing um, you know, early last year, right? So it's gonna evolve. The consumer behavior will evolve significantly in the Philippines. But look at what's happening in Korea. And you can actually get a general idea where you know, our, our sister company is uh, uh, actually a leader. Uh, and you can al almost see where the market will progress towards, in, in Asia, by the way. How about in the Philippines? Um, let's talk about product mix. Uh, in the beginning, we saw you know, lots of uh, service deals, restaurants, spas, uh, massages, and the like. And then I, I've noticed a shift toward product. Um, is, that, is product here to stay, or is that just part of the evolution? Um, I, I think there, there's a couple ways to answer that question. There's the way to answer that question from a bottom line perspective. There's a question. There's a way to answer that question from uh, from the perspective of shareholders of Groupon, right? And so I'll answer it in both ways, and I'll be completely honest with you guys. Again, if you guys follow the stock, you'll know that we were the we were the darling of Wall Street when we first IPO'd, and now we're kind of like one of those like embarrassing little um, type of things or whatever. But um, again, there's a reason for that. So number one, the bottom line perspective is that goods will sell. It's e-commerce, and I think uh, you know all the other e-commerce players here um, that, that are maybe I guess Lazada and Zalora, um, all those guys, or even all the other deal sites, they're moving goods because it's something that people want. It's a tangible item; they can get it at a great price. Why not, right? Um, I think the second, uh, the, the other way to answer this again is from the pers pers excuse me perspective of the shareholders is that investors invested in Groupon or this business model because. Local business is the only type of business or industry that has been untapped by the internet, right? Again, that's the first, that's the real uh, innovation of Groupon. It's bringing local businesses the exposure that they've never gotten before to the internet, right? Amazon did it for the retailers, right? Who's doing it for all the local businesses? And that's what Groupon did, right? However, once we started doing all these goods deals and we saw that, you know, that, that goods was really growing, investors were like, that's not what we invested in you for. And so, again, th this is the truth. And, and so, um, for us, local business is really our, our, our core value proposition. We want to bring local business to the internet. But why not have goods there in the first place? Uh, why not have goods there to augment that, right? And so, uh, you know, without saying too much, because I, I'm actually limited as to what I can say because we're a publicly traded company, I apologize. Um, I, I think that's kind of going to drive, you know, hit the nail on the head, if you will. Is that right? Is that how you say it? <laughs> Any other uh, differing thoughts, Jojo, uh, Fred? Um, um, okay, there is a lot of question in your question. Uh, the number one was about the service. Uh, the number two was about the product. Um, I don't know, I heard a lot of people who say there is a deal fatigue or, or things like that. Um, I, I don't think so, I, actually, I'm talking about Philippines. I'm not talking about the, the worldwide market. Uh, once again, being independent have the advantage to adapt your product whatever you want to the local specificities. So um, I don't think there is a deal fatigue because uh, if you take a website like Metro Deal, for example, they are really, really focused on service and they sell very well. So um, I guess the, pro the, the point is just these websites are the one who open the e-commerce. And the truth is once you taste uh, 
something, you want something else. Once you bought five restaurants and maybe you didn't use one of the five, so you're upset or whatever, you want to buy something else. Or once you have a very good experience, you want something else. And because you already have a relationship with this website, that's one thing. Now, I think the second point is probably the business model in itself. Um, to make it simple, when you talk to a service uh, partner, uh, roughly you say to the guy, I'm going to sell your product at 50 off, more or less. Uh, so that means someone who sells something at 100 peso is going to sell it at 50. But on the 50, there is a part for you. Depends of the company, but historically, the idea was you give me 50. More so or less. that means so that, that means the that merchant takes a 75% hit. Is that, that right? That means at the end, the product, uh, the, product the, the spa or whatever that I sell you at 100, I'm selling it to you at 25. The problem is there is a lot of business model where it's very tricky to, uh, to have a sustainable business model in this case. Um, so the solution of that is to decrease your commission. But if you decrease your commission, is it still profitable? Yes, if you have a crazy volume of sales. Or else, not so much. So, the second, so that's the second thing. The business model is tricky. The third one for me in service is the inventory. I mean, this business, more or less, is really, uh, in Philippines at least, it's really pushed by restaurant. Spa sell, everything sell, yeah, but food. I mean, I'm sure it's not a surprise for anyone. Uh, Filipino is the food addict uh, country, so. Uh, and the problem is, you're not in New York, you're not in Paris, you're not in whatever. You don't have 10,000 aspirational restaurants in Philippines. It's not true. So that, that brings a very interesting point, right? What what kinds of merchants should work with uh, with with you guys? Is it is it just new startup or uh, you know uh, newly started up restaurants or or, or should well established names also go with you? Can I speak? Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so so I think um, just to answer that question quickly, the. The, there's definitely a r a room for merchants from and all the way to top brands to utilize this platform. Uh, so first and foremost. Um, now, I, again, I, I use those terms sort of interchangeably, but they are actually two different uh, partners, right? The merchants are the ones that the spots, etc., that we currently deal with, the restaurants, and then the brands. Some of you guys I know here, um, the top brands actually are now just starting to realize the power of this platform to, for example, push um, you know, expire, nearly expiring um, inventory, et cetera, in such a short time, right? Um, but the, the problem is those two have two different requirements. So on the first one, I think I allude to what Fred was talking about. The problem is that the, the merchants that actually don't really see the value, right? This is the restaurant that is taking a 75% hit um, because they don't realize that they actually have to take that, some of that hit anyway to pay for a billboard in EDSA, right? But they're not factoring that in the computation. Is that right, Fred? So it's, so a, it's, so a, marketing it's a marketing cost. tool, yeah, but it's, it's tricky tool. for them to consider that right. as a marketing tool. So, so, so again, let me just, uh, fit, just, I'll just wrap up. The, the merchant that we are, again, going to partner with are the ones that are going to understand that value proposition more. There, um, so I, I have to say that there are merchants that don't understand that, and therefore, the, you know, even if we actually do a good job for them, they may not see the value. The ones that are obviously starting to see the value and actually are asking a different level of questions, and I, in fact, I, I allude to what Patrick had said about um, how they're, they're thinking of this platform, uh, not just from a planning perspective, uh, there's actually opportunities to address the holy grail of marketing in this platform. Great. Um, you know, we're halfway through this discussion and uh, some text in questions are beginning to stream in. So let's uh, take a peek. I'm going to read it for you guys. Uh, the question is, are there, is, there st is there still room to grow for group buying sites after dozens of sites have been in place and some have already shut down? So this, this speaks about the consolidation that you guys uh, 
are talking about. Any response to this question, Pat? Um, I think there's huge potential here. Or otherwise, I would probably leave Group One, to be quite honest with you. Um, and I'll tell you why there's huge potential, not just from a, a social commerce perspective or our industry perspective, but I think it's the reason why we're all here right now. Uh, we're here at the summit because we see the we see the the promise in in digital commerce for the Philippines. Um, if we talk about all the different macro environments or even micro environment factors that play that come into play with our industry, there's inherent growth there. That's number one. Number two, I think in terms of our industry here, I think we're only just hitting the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we can do. Um, and without getting into too much detail, that's, that's really my thought. Uh, you know, bottom line, there's huge growth potential here in the Philippines for, for social commerce. Mm, there is different answer to that one. There is pro and cons. Uh, honestly, you want to launch a group buying now in Philippines, as and so go Groupon or Cash Cash or Metro, don't. It's gonna cost you a lot. It's going to cost a lot, lot of money. The market is quite established already, and um, the acquisition of the database, the competition is kind of tough, even if it's a friendly but, but, discussion. But Fred, sorry to interrupt, but you know we're at less than 1% of Philippine wait, wait, retail. I said pro and cons. Sorry, so I, 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 also <laughs> I also would like to say that I answered that question from the perspective of our companies, not necessarily from, a, from one of you guys that want to start a social commerce site. Right? I think that's going to be very difficult. I'm, I'm telling you right now, save your money. Um, but for the, for the most part, from, from our perspective, or those, the, the top five that Fred was talking about, there's huge potential for, for growth there. Yes, so that's what I was going to say. If, I mean, there's a lot of people, I'm sure, here who are thinking about that. So um, don't launch a, a clone or, or a similar system to this one. It's going to be very complicated. Now, beside that, yes, there is a lot of opportunity for a specific platform who propose a specific type of product or service, who address a specific population. Um, the province market currently, it's nothing, to be honest. This is a 95% Metro Manila uh, business, including product. So we have a lot of, of, of market to tap there also. Um, if I have a rough estimation of the, the, the size of all the websites um, in Metro Manila, I mean, there is what, 19 million of people, 20 million in Metro Manila. I'm kind of sure that all in maybe these sites talk to maybe four, four millions of people. So there is still a lot, especially now, the penetration of internet keep on increasing. We were talking yesterday about the mobile who keep on increasing. So no, I think there is still a lot of room, but for sure, this model will have to adapt. I mean, Cash Cash, for example, is already the V5 of the system that we are going to release in, in March. Uh, now, the major part of, of my revenue is made through product. I have a complete flow. I import everything from, from China. We have, I mean, the, the whole flow has been, has been built. Um, of course, if you compare that to two years ago, that was not the same business model at all. So as Jojo was saying earlier, it's kind of roller coaster. It's uh, your ability to see what's the trend, not the worldwide trend. You're in the Philippines. So what's the trend here? how you can adapt yourself, how you can move, what makes sense, is there a business model, et cetera, et cetera. So Joe, any, anything to add? I mean, if we were to have a crystal ball and, and you know, what's gonna happen to deal sites, group buying sites, in the next six to 12 months, we can't think longer than that, right? What, 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 what's in store for us in the next uh, year? Hello, so, um, so first of all, social commerce, right? Um, and uh, I, I can't tell you too much about what, you know, maybe uh, without revealing uh, some of our strategy, but uh, definitely I, I agree with these guys. It, it's gonna evolve. Um, and I would, I would say that I think we, we, we are, you know, the, the top sites are definitely gonna probably um, uh, diversify. I mean, that, that's, that's definitely a given. But the core, at least in terms of um, providing the best value in the market will still be there. Um, you know, you know I, I think the, the, the top brands, and you'll see actually on our site, are starting to discover what the small merchants are benefiting from. And in fact, we're, we're providing a tremendous value for the small, mer small merchants. So I think that the top brands are now starting to realize, whoa, that's actually a great way to actually get consumer information, being able to pu push inventory, and um, be able to drive uh, consumers uh, and, and, and that's the other thing that, that I think what people miss out on. Um, you know, we, 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 we are actually at the transaction side. We're where the 
transactions happen, and it's probably where, if you look at the, the funnel, it's also the most uh, expensive to acquire spenders, right? So if you can actually link um, those sites that are actually driving awareness, right, with sites like ours, you know, for example, partnership with Yahoo, Google, et cetera, that is actually essentially what I was referring to earlier about connecting a closed loop marketing. Thanks for the uh, the insight, uh, Joe. So you know, a lot of interesting points, a lot of answers to the to the questions so far. So I guess what what comes to my mind now is, uh, you know, you're saying that the top five will will you know will 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 make this to the next round uh, as part of the consolidation. Now, is there actual competition between the top this top five? I mean, are you guys all doing the same game? I mean, I hear from Fred that he's doing mostly product. You know, and 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 Jojo's talking about helping small entrepreneurs. Um, is it fair to say that you guys are actually competing with each other, or, or is the is the is the is the enemy uh, offline uh, retail? No, I think one hundred percent. I think it would be uh, unwise to call us uh, to not call us competitors, right? Um, because it's it's we need to see what each other is doing, and uh, essentially that's how group that's how all the other sites started. Sites started, right? They were looking at what Group One was doing, and how do we copy that? Uh, just to be completely frank with you guys, right? Uh, <laughs> um, but really, what it comes down to is that yes, we are competitors, but in terms of individual strategies, I think you know for the most part people have certain blinders, but we can be adaptive to what's going on with the current markets. If you think about it from 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 the most basic level, um, we're all going after merchants. You know, you want or you want the you know the merchant just as much as we want the merchant, right? And so you know that's where we can really compete. That's where you know really when we go in and pitch, we're in competition with each other. Um, yeah, we copy Groupon, but we don't have money from US when we have a problem. <laughs> so I'm just saying we are competitors. <laughs> no, I get it by myself. I have to find VC investor when I have problems. I have to find solution by myself. But isn't that how Groupon did it? They got $1.1 billion in funding. That's how we did it. It's the same exact way, Fred. I would Sorry. love to have my sugar daddy. Just being frank with you again, right? <laughs> where is where is Sherry? Sh sh What's the name of it? Yeah, where is yeah, Cherry, Cherry today? Cherry, where are you? <laughs> oh, this is the, the panel's doing fine without Cherry, I think. <laughs> That's the goal of the idea. That, is that what we wanted to do this morning, Fred? Yeah. Jojo? <laughs> that's, what, that's what we said this morning. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, of course we are competitor. Uh, but at the end of the day, everybody has a, a different landscape. I was joking about the, the, the money because in any case, when you are living and when you are group and when your PNL is shitty, you have major problems. So I'm just saying, um, when you are, in my, in my case, when you are an independent, uh, the innovation, uh, the speed of execution, which is an advantage because we can do whatever we want. It's going very fast. Uh, that's our asset. So definitely, we are competitor. But in the meantime, I know, for example, that there is some uh, deal that I will not hunt, but Jojo will hunt. For example, uh, on Ansogo, you have a lot of uh, perishable uh, uh, food deal. You will not see a lot of that on, on, on Cash Cash. Um, we have another player which is not here today, a deal grocer, for example. Obviously, we are competitor on some offer, but on some, we will not be. Because this uh, offer would not have sense on Cash Cash Pinoy. So, I would say the competition, yes, because we are in the same industry, definitely. But in the meantime, at this point, the market starts to uh, organize by, uh, by itself. Joe, any, uh, any comments to Fred? Um, you know, first of all, I want to answer your question. Yeah, we're competitors. I mean, we, we sit here, we look like we're laughing, we're friends. But deep down, we're, uh, <laughs> we're you know, we're, we're, we're friends. We're, uh, <laughs> anyway, so... Um, I have someone hacking your laptop while you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, but, but I would just want to clarify that um, there are tremendous opportunities... The top layers were, will continue to grow. Um, th there is just an approach to the business that I definitely have tremendous respect for. And the people I have here, uh, I think we, we need competition in any industry that's actually uh, highly evolving and a copy-paste business model. And to credit um, Groupon, yes, it's a copy-paste business model. You guys innovated. Uh, but at the same time, we're, we're going to take it higher to another level. 
and that requires you know extreme competition. But obviously, there there are sites that are actually doing it a in a professional way, and I respect the guys that I actually have here. So I think over time, the problem is on a long-term basis, right? The question is, uh, are these guys actually eroding market value or creating market value? And the ones that are actually looking at it on a long term, I'd say, are, are aiming for creating market value. Yeah, actually, I, I would push for that because, um, yeah, of course, we are competitor. No one is challenging that. But in the meantime, I can tell you that on some topic, we are not competitor at all. I mean, we are hand in hand and uh, very good friends and we sit down. Um, once again, it's a pioneer industry. Um, I really hope some of you one day will launch something like that in this type of market because you'll see how every day you face situations that you would never imagine. You have to create solution. Um, you have to face situations that you don't imagine. And at some point, if we don't work hand in hand, we just kill our, our, our business. Um, it's, a, it's a common joke about the customer support or things like that, but let's be clear. Um, when one player screw, because there is no other word, a bunch of customer, of course, his website is affected, but the whole industry is affected. I don't know for my, my two partner, but recently there was a, a issue with travel deal. Uh, there was one player called Cleverby, for example, who closed and two German who run away. So, uh, of course, it's funny. You have Bandila, TV Patrol, and it's, and it's nice, but beside the 80 or 100 people who have problem with their travel, and, and it's funny to see that at Bandila, I can tell you that suddenly on your system, the sale of travel deal completely fall down. And uh, it's not by magic. I mean, the perception is still very sensitive. So when something like that happens, suddenly we are all punished. So we don't have choice also on some topic. We have to work together. We talk about customer support, government regulation. Uh, I know we all have issue in terms of logistic for province. How can we do something? Um, the bandwidth, we were talking about that yesterday, et cetera, et cetera. So as of today, we can say that it's a, a smart competition. Probably if we were in a more mature market like US or, or, uh, or Europe, it would be tougher. Actually, I'm even sure you would not be able to have this panel uh, in Europe. Well, you know, you know Fred, you, you raise a very uh, major point about you know, the, need, the need for, you know, of, of course you're competing, uh, but we also need to, to work together and in fact, uh, because we face very, you know, some, some very common issues that's why with we're here. respect to consumer support. And that's precisely why we have formed, you know, DCOM uh, to, to, to solve this, these issues as, as, as a group. Now, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about, you know, the consumer shopping experience. Just one thing, yeah. Jack, sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's good also to show that. Uh, one time I remember I hired someone who previously worked for Groupon. We had a phone call from Groupon that the guy has a, a close and we just let the guy go. Does that happen often? You, you, you oh, guys poach people from each other? It happens sometimes. It's uh, an industry, especially for sales team, it moves a lot. So I'm just saying, in this case, I didn't receive a letter from lawyer or whatever. I received a phone call from Dave or, 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 or Pat, I don't remember who, but, <laughs> and we just didn't take the guy. Uh, another day, it was a, a picture I remember from Groupon. I just sent an email to, to, to Dave. I don't remember who. And, and they just changed the picture. I mean, we are still in this type of, of relationship, at least between this player. So that's why I, I want to insist it's still a friendly competition. It's not, you know, we are not child. We know that, but it's not kindergarten. But at least at this point, uh, these players know that they have interest to play hand in a hand. And, and we hope that, you know, DCOM will, uh, you know, continue to play a big role in, in, in fostering that cooperation. So let's talk about the consumer shopping experience. You know, uh, the, the, uh, the undersecretary yesterday mentioned that there were and this was a surprise to all of us, right? Only 200 consumer complaints uh, in the past 12 months. Now, I am wondering, you know, I, I'm sure like SM and, and the other mall operators get hundreds of, of thousands uh, every, every, every year. So it's uh, actually an amazing, an amazing statistic. But no, nonetheless, in the past 12 months, we've all had our share of uh, media exposure about, you know, this concern, whether it was just an isolated case of a, of a German travel agent, you know, uh, running away uh, from, from, from their customers here. But how have you guys, uh, you know, dealt, dealt with that? And, and um, you know, um, you know if, if there's anything that, that you think 
we can you we can work together on to strengthen the the consumer uh, experience. Um, I'll start, guys, if that's okay. I think uh, I'll just <laughs> I'll just uh, reiterate what Jojo said. I think it really does start with the merchant uh, that we choose, um, and so. Um, without getting too, too much detail about what we do to serve our customers, because that really is our focus, um, it starts there. And you have to think about every single aspect of really who's your customer, uh, which are again are the merchants and, and the subscribers, but every aspect of where they are in, in any part of either the funnel or the life cycle of, of whatever they're doing, right? And so um, looking at it from that perspective, you can glean a lot of different actions for each specific step, and that's what we're really focusing on. Um, uh, you know, again, logistics was an issue yesterday. We, we talked about it. Um, everybody was up here saying that logistics is perfect and stuff like that, but it really is not. Um, there's a lot of issues on, on that. I mean, I think 31% of our issues that come in through customer service are really simply because of the fact uh, non-delivery of items, right? When we have, you know, provided everything that we should have provided, and yet the, the our fulfillment provider has not been able to fulfill it. I don't know what your statistics are like, but it's 31% on our side. In fact, the top three reasons uh, for, for customer service issues Groupon is because of uh, fulfillment problems, fulfillment issues. And so um, we're doing whatever we can. Um, we're, again, we're, we're working on a partnership level with the fulfillment uh, partners that, that we use um, in order to try to address those issues. And once we get rid of I mean, once we fix that, that's already, what is 57% of our problems, or 57% of the tickets that come in for us, right? And so um, I will just say, though, that the DTI mentioned that Groupon has the least number of DTI complaints. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, throwing it out there. Good job. <laughs> Uh, Joe, any anything to add on the cons customer support uh, yeah, process? Yeah, so, so customer satisfaction, again, to reiterate, um, uh, it starts with the merchant. Uh, some of you may not realize that there are actually merchants that uh, want to launch deals, and it's actually not good for consumers. No surprise, right? So, in fact, uh, it takes a, a very professional platform provider, social commerce site, to actually uh, have the discipline to say no to those merchants. And that's why I guess the guys that I have here I respect for um, because they have that discipline. I think that's So, so Joe, what you're saying is you, you turn down a lot of deals. Yes, absolutely. Oh yeah, a lot. I mean, okay. uh, I'm, sure you receive a, I'm sure you receive a lot of inquiry and you would be surprised on the inquiry you receive sometimes. So what is the process and criteria before you, you post a deal? Um, just going back to your question, I think also about uh, the, the customer support and the 200 complaints per year. Yeah, I was surprised also about this figure. I think people also must um, stop to have fantasy about online business. I mean, what we own to the customer is a good customer service, as good as we can expect from a normal business, let's say a retail business. When I say as good, that means not less, not more. I mean, at some point, I, I give that example often, but yes, uh, last year, I used to receive a complaint of people who wanted to be refund of their holidays because it was raining. And for the people, it's normal. I mean, you know, they should re request for a refund. Why? Because we are online. Actually, 200 complaints in one year, that means once per working day, uh, which probably it's 0.01% uh, of the transaction that uh, all are doing, it's nothing. So I would say that the quality of customer support, despite what meet people could have, it's very good. Actually, it's quite good. Totally agree. Um, I would also add to that, that I think it's easy to complain about something that people don't really understand yet. And when we're talking about our, our subscriber base, there's a lot of people who don't really understand what it means to really shop online uh, that, or what e-commerce really is. And so you're, you're right, Fred, that people do have fantasies as to what they should expect from shopping with us. And I think uh, it, it's so new that people don't understand that they, can, that they really should be comparing it to a normal traditional so, business. So are you saying, uh, and Joe, sorry to interject, but are, are you saying that internet shopping sites are being held to a different standard than, than traditional retail? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I think for now, for now. I mean. And, and you know what? I think w looking at it that way, knowing that we're looking at it that way, or knowing that consumers are looking at it that way, we can serve them and try to in, in different ways. Which the one thing I would disagree with is that we would always try to wow the customer above and beyond anybody else. So we talk about the SMs. I would love to have better service in SM. I've shopped at SM before. Or if you've ever cl called into Globe, my God. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I would never want, sorry if anybody here is from Globe. I apologize in advance. We can talk later if you want or go out the parking lot, <laughs> duke it out. Um, but really, like seriously, like I would want to change how people perceive customer service. And, and I think we have the responsibility to do so. 
right? Just for our customers. We have the obligation to do so. So uh, I'll just add, you know, it, it takes also uh, in the panel that I, I was mentioning earlier that uh, the investment and, and the, um, the focus from the highest level in the organization, you know, me, myself, for example, I monitor the, the metrics of customer satisfaction. So I know, for example, how many, uh, how many uh, phone calls we abandon as a person percentage. I know, uh, you know, our, our, our customer support hotline, for example. Um, I also monitor, for example, the, um, the, uh, pa uh, the, the percentage of uh, emails that we actually close uh, in 24 hours. So n just knowing those actually provides, makes sure that we actually are focused on customer service. And uh, actually, not a lot of online sites, as I said uh, yesterday, the, the problem is a lot of online sites think that as an after afterthought, not as a key metric uh, of managing operations. I think that's uh, also interesting. Uh, I, I shift off topic, but it's connected. Um, you also have to create a new type of management and organization in your company when you launch in this adventure. To give you an example, at Cash Cash, 85% of the employees have incentive. 85%. And in this incentive, it's quite complicated, but part of that, it's connected to customer satisfaction metrics. So I think that's part of what I was saying earlier about you need to invent, a create solution, etc. Um, my point was, was more the hardcore example when I was talking about uh, customer satisfaction. Would you call a travel agency to ask a refund because it was raining? I mean, you would not. Now, going back to your question, Jack, about how we choose uh, uh, the merchant, I don't know for my, uh, my partner, but uh, in, in our case, uh, we make an ocula most of the time. Uh, for province, it's quite tricky for hotel. So in this case, you investigate. Um, I think the key stuff also for us, uh, there is two things. I mean, on my case, when there is a hit and miss, I take the miss. For example, a uh, few y one year ago, we had a restaurant called La Maison. Um, we sold like a lot of voucher, and the guy disappeared three weeks after. I don't know where he is. I'm so, who who uh, did did the consumers who bought the vouchers, Fred, get the refund? I take my loss. More than one million peso. But I take my loss. That's the price to pay. Which is why I, I, I'd like to just add that, um, again, it's the education of the market. I think the way people have uh, done deals in the past, with the way the deal sites have done deals in the past, um, I, uh, to be completely honest, I don't think that they were really looking at it from a long-term sustainability model. But when you're going to pay your merchants 100% upfront, there is risk to that. There's a lot of financial risk to that, and that's what you've experienced, Fred, right? And so. Um, in terms of the way the, the market was educated with, with the merchants, you know, giving them 100% upfront payment or, or whatever it is that, you know, that people are offering them, uh, they expect that from every other site now, right? And so um, with that, though, I mean, how can, we how can we really base our business off of all this risk? Yeah, but the, 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 the problem is you have to take in consideration, as you said, that we open the market. Trust me, when you arrive in Philippines, you talk to a restaurant guy. Most of the time, there are five or six restaurants. And you tell to the guy, okay, I'm going to sell something. You're going to give me a discount. On the discount, I'm going to get a share. At the end of the day, it will remain you only that. And I'll pay you only that, and I'll pay you the remaining uh, in one month or whatever. Maybe now, maybe now they are used to, because we have two years and a half of experience. But I can tell you, when you were talking to this guy for the first time, you don't imagine how many times they said, no, 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 yeah. no. So can I just add, I think the, the, the problem, Jack, is that um, from a consumer standpoint, the, the consumers cannot differentiate between a site that's actually looking long term and looking after their welfare and, and definitely getting, you know, the, the proper merchants and partners on their site. You know, from a consumer standpoint, a great deal is a great deal, right? And, and unfortunately, sometimes they will end up taking uh, a risk, but actually us as professionals, is what um, Fred had mentioned, we essentially take the burden when, when actually the deal falls through. Right. So this is, uh, this is very useful, I think, and uh, something that not all uh, online shoppers appreciate, that you, know, you guys, uh, at least most deal sites, actually uh, do a lot of filtering of, of deals and, and merchants before you post them on, on your site. Not everybody. So, you mm -hmm. know, um, and I guess you know, one, of the, the, you know, one of the objectives of DCOM is really to to establish certain standards depending on the subcategory of, uh, of, of e-commerce. So this is a very useful, useful point. Now, um, let's talk about the public perception, though. And, and, and before I ask this last question, if you guys 
you know, have any text in questions or uh, we, we will allot uh, a few minutes to take questions from the audience. But I do have one question on consumer percep perception, which I think is, is appropriate at this point. You know, when, when we talk of deal sites or group buying sites, the, the, the perception often is that, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of concern and, and, and fear from the traditional, you know, uh, first time shopper to, to do something. But, but, but I think we're entering a stage where, you know, we, we need to get over that fear, uh, probably because of one or two uh, uh, unfortunate deals in the past that, that got featured on TV. But if, if, if the 200 uh, complaints last year is actually true, that's, that's really quite minuscule uh, compared to, I'm, I'm sure, the number of complaints that SM uh, gets, right? And, and, and where's the DTI on, on, on that? Uh, but is there anything you guys wanna, wanna say to our, to our audience about, you know, about this, this, this perception? It sounds to me that despite being quite new and, 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 and reinventing and tweaking our, our model and our customer support uh, processes, it looks like we're actually doing a f pretty damn good job in, in, in managing uh, complaints, but that is not the perception. Uh, I will say, I mean, yes, I, I understand that perception because of the media and all that kind of stuff is, um, has been negative on our industry. Um, however, when I talk to people, maybe it's a little biased, where when I talk to people, it's really mixed reviews. Either they hate the, the write-ups on Groupon or they love the fact that we're offer, able to offer great deals and stuff like that. I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't really have any other insight about that, to be completely honest with you. I think it's really just mixed reviews for me, and, and that's what I'm seeing uh, with Groupon. And I think it really just shows with the fact that people continue to buy, right? <laughs> I think Jojo was saying earlier, uh, I, he was saying about the fact that these guys uh, are, are, are serious and even if we are competitor, we don't, uh, uh, how can I say that? We you don't respect hurt each other. Yeah, we don't hurt the industry. Um, I think one of the advantage we had is if you, if you check the, the, the landscape, more or less, these five players, you have two international groups, so they cannot screw. They are international group. they don't have choice. They have to be super, super serious about that. So but uh, it's already 40% of the problem who are uh, taking off. Uh, on the free of a player, definitely some are more um, concerned about that. And you were saying, what's the, the, the solution to that? For me, um, it's a pioneer industry. That's the polite way to say it. The non-polite way, it's the jungle. So that means um, the way you decide to do business depends on the way you want to do business. If you want to, I don't know, sell an hotel, knowing that the hotel can accommodate only maybe, can, I, I don't make you the computation, but you know that the hotel can accommodate 300 voucher, and you sell 1,000 voucher, knowing that you will have 700 people who will not be accommodated, but part of these people will be refunding credit, so you keep the cash, etc., etc. Yeah, that is not ethic. If you want to sell a restaurant knowing that what you're selling, what you're saying, doesn't reflect what the consumer will experience at the end, yeah. as of today, it's tricky. It's true because there is no clear regulation. So Fred, in that example of the hotel, you're s you, you are admitting that the site is responsible for, for monitoring the, uh, you know, selling the appropriate number of vouchers. I mean, that's what Jojo was saying. Some, some merchants are, are bad merchants, of course. There is stingy guy, there is guy uh, had problems with, you know, stupid things. You say in the deal that it's free flow beer and when the guy arrives, there is no free flow beer. Yeah, that type of things happen. But honestly, majority of the merchants we are working with are serious guys with good relationship, who makes money with us, we make, we make money with them. Uh, so if you take off that proportion of merchant, of course, it's the responsibility of the website. In the past, some didn't really play the game, like they have to. That's why there was this feature on, on, on TV and, 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 and stuff like that. So I think the key thing for me will be the ability to the complete industry to stick uh, to this ethical approach, this normal business. I mean, once again, in mature market, you cannot do that in US, you cannot do that in Europe, you cannot, you can. You do that, you go in immediately in court and you have crazy problems. Here, it's not the same as of today. It's a jungle. Yep. Uh, Joe, any last uh, words before we open up the uh, questions to, to the floor? So, so let me address maybe the, the two questions that you had. One is the uh, market perception, right? Um, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, you know, back in 2000, uh, when uh, 
online commerce, uh, my parent, Amazon.com, actually had this same perception problem, same issues that um, Groupon is actually having now. Fast forward, you know, a few years later, a decade later, they're actually the, continues to be the darling of Wall Street. In fact, they were the only one uh, at this time that survived the dot-com bubble and hi that have the highest uh, PE multiples right, uh, right now. So I think the market perception uh, will, will solve itself. As long as we have actually professional uh, players in the industry, and, and, the, and the guys I have here, I have respect for, and we will actually solve that, right? And, and so I think over time, it's, it's really just, uh, we're, we're gonna have to get out of this jungle and actually move on to uh, you know, more civilized uh, roads. And actually, just to have a positive note, uh, it's less the jungle that it was, uh Two years ago, honestly, there is less and less cases like that. The 200 of the DTI seems to prove that, knowing that there is a lot more transaction. So I would say things are going in the, in the good way. But unfortunately, something, sometimes you have a, a magnifier effect and you have a huge scandal who make a lot of noise. It sounds all very, very positive, despite some of the hurdles that we have faced in, in, in this uh, jungle of ours. So we want to open up uh, questions to the floor. I think we have maybe five minutes uh, remaining in this panel discussion. So if there's anyone uh, who, who has a question, please feel free to approach a mic and please introduce yourself. Uh, Hello. <coughs> Dick from Dragonpay. I, I was having this uh, sideline question actually with Fred yesterday, so I, I kind of know Fred's answer. But I would like to know uh, JoJo's and Pat's a view on this. But of course, Fred, feel free to uh, voice your opinion to the rest of the group. Uh, why isn't group buying working outside of Metro Manila? Um, okay, I, I think there's multiple reasons, but I think it's, it's, uh, there are very similar reasons as to why we are in our infancy right now in Metro Manila. I think e-commerce in general is, it, it is in its infancy. Um, again, that's the reason why we're here, right? Um, in, in populations, I think uh, Cebu was at 2.5 million people um, compared to Metro Manila with, I think it's actually 11 million people, or something like that, um, than 20 million. Um, and then Daba with even less, uh, it, it becomes very difficult. I mean, and then on top of that, those logistics and fulfillment problems that we spoke about earlier are, are magnified in those, in those cities. Um, there's, uh, again, I've done this, uh, this presentation with a few other fulfillment companies that I know of, but um, I think with e-commerce, and we just spoke about this this morning, with e-commerce specifically, anybody can create, uh, th there's specific things that I think that, are, that make a great e-commerce site, um, but what some people fail to understand, and this is what Amazon understands, is that uh, fulfillment is just a, as much a part of your business than, than anything else that you can do, right? And so I think that's kind of missing, not just here in Metro Manila, but also I especially more in those provincial areas. Um, that, but we also have those other macro environment factors such as, you know, uh, internet penetration, credit card usage, or e even credit card trust, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we just have a longer way to go there. And I'm not saying that there's no uh, potential there. I think there's huge potential in those markets. It, we just need to get to that point. And right now, we're still just on tip of iceberg for, for Metro Manila. Did that, did that make sense? Okay. So, so Dick, it's not out, out of, um, I'd say the answer is prioritization. But, um, but first of all, it's not out of um, lack of opportunity. It's there. I mean, we've done deals where uh, there are, um, I think, chicks to go with uh, a couple of hundred um, branches. And we've actually monitored the take up rate, the demand. Uh, it's tremendous, right? But if you look at the, the model, the core model, it, you know, you're trying to get as much density as much as possible and, and consumers target in one area. Um, and that's how the business evolved. But as we actually mi uh, di um, migrated to and, and uh, diversified the model with products, that's definitely an opportunity. In fact, that has been an opportunity in 2012. So it's not so much that actually we're not. We, the business model started out with focusing on basically urban centers. I, if I can just add to that, Dick. Have you ever been to Davao by any chance? Has anybody here ever been to Davao? Um, isn't it amazing? This is the first time I've ever seen this in my life. You can get a full buffet for 123 pesos, right? And so to put a deal on that at, as well as take a commission on that is very, very difficult for a lot of merchants. I'm, I'm using that extreme, 123 pesos, just because it's easy to, to remember. It was, it's like, wow, 123 pesos. But now, you know, extrapolating that to a lot of the other just, just the way things are priced or just the economy down there um, is just very different. It's, it's just, uh, I think it's something that we still have to un, un, unlock, I guess. Um, and we don't have the answers to those yet, but th I think that's just another issue that we have to consider. 
Um, any any last questions from from the floor before we wrap up what has been a very uh, interesting and uh, animated uh, panel discussion? <laughs> I, I got what I wanted. For it. Wow. Okay. There's no more questions from the floor. So um, Texan questions. <laughs> somebody. Oh, text. Question. Oh, there is a Texan question. Let me read it. What are the deal sites doing to penetrate Cebu, Davao, and the provinces? And what are the key factors slowing adoption in those markets? I think you answered some of that, uh, Pat. I, I think just to get right to the point, uh, in terms of the key things that we're doing, I can tell you it's none. And, and Jojo brought it up as prioritization. We want to really capitalize on, on Metro Manila first before we really capitalize on those other markets. Um, that's just the best way of answering, right? So how how far much. are you guys, though, in, in penetrating Metro Manila itself? I mean, if 90% of the deals are, are here, uh, and, and we're just kind of midway through, uh, there's a lot of potential still in Metro Manila without having to go outside. Is that accurate? Actually, I think it's connected also to your global uh, strategy. Um, we're talking about the deal we are hunting. Honestly, I'm not looking for a nationwide uh, deal of, of food or things like that. First, because most of the time, the company who have large franchise, that's what uh, Pat was saying, it's like, for example, food company. Uh, when they already have a, a meal at 52 pesos, what do you want to sell? And, and the, the, the margin will be too small. Um, now, so nationwide, with a lot of branches, it's too complicated for me, and I don't really see the profitability. The second thing would be more, I think Ensogo did it at some point, uh, it's the group on model, to have specific um, team on each market. Uh, pff, from my perspective, I see two issues. The number one issue is an issue of inventory. I mean, you were talking about Dabao. Me, if I talk about Cebu, for example, at the end of the day, how many aspirational restaurants you have in Cebu? How many aspirational lifestyle activity? Um, I don't know, but trust me, there is not enough for sure to sustain uh, a full-time uh, activity. Then you have also the problem of the market. Uh, Two million people, two million point half. Okay, but how many are on internet, ready to buy online, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So personally, for me, province it's not an opportunity; it's the opportunity, definitely. If I compare to U.S. or or, or, uh, or Europe, I mean, in U.S. it's not the cool uh, chick of uh, New York who make the e-commerce ramp up; it's the family mother of Iowa. She is the one who make the e-commerce explode. So same thing. Uh, the sparkle is coming from the Manila uh, Kikai. No offense for the Kikai. Uh, but uh, it's really the family mother from Naga who will make things ramping up. So that's why for me, province definitely product. So it looks like you know, we will, we will uh, venture into the provinces, but, but, you know, which is really the essence of, 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 of the sites, right? Very local uh, sites serving local neighborhoods by local uh, neighborhood merchants. Hyper-local is what we like to call it. Great. So this has been a very uh, informative session. Of thanks to our sparkling panelists.